Richard, those were uh, certainly uh, very fine remarks. I hardly recognize myself um, listening to them, and uh, thank you very much. I think you're certainly very fortunate to have uh, Richard on your faculty. Uh, in thinking about the kind of work that he's done over the years as a, as a teacher and a scholar, um, sort of, uh, you know, reminds me of the biblical story about the uh, planting of the mustard seed and, uh, and you, know, with, with, you know, particularly with Richard's uh, contact and all he did for our Kyle way, way back when, uh, you sort of think about the, the impact that teachers can have uh, sometimes when you don't even know you're having impact. So uh, you've just got all sorts of things that you've scattered about uh, over the years. Um, as Richard said, I want to talk a little bit <clears throat> this afternoon about the Supreme Court minus uh, Justice Scalia. And I guess one way to start is to simply um, ask you to kind of reflect on something. Think about where we are. Make no mistake about it. This year, 2016, is not your grandparents' ordinary election year. The campaign for the White House has looked more like a traveling carnival than a race for the highest office in the land. And then when you look at the goings on with the Supreme Court, that resembles a game of chicken. So where were we back at the beginning of the year? Supreme Court heard arguments in two cases on Wednesday, January 20th, when the court next convened for oral arguments after a recess about a month later. On February 22nd, it did so without Justice Scalia. His death on February 13th, just four weeks shy of his 80th birthday, and in his 29th year on the court, shocked the nation, and it tossed the future of the court squarely into the political arena. His death was also only the second death of a sitting member of the court in the last 62 years. But what difference did it make? Justice Scalia's passing meant not only the loss of a razor-sharp wit, a prickly critic of an imperious judiciary, and perhaps the most energetic questioner at oral argument. It also meant the loss of one of the modern era's most dependable and enthusiastic judicial advocates of originalism as the correct method for interpreting the Constitution and textualism as the method to be preferred for construing the laws passed by Congress. The departure of so distinctive of a voice quickly made it apparent that the court's public sessions had changed fundamentally, just as surely had, as had its internal dynamics as well, the way the justices interact with each other. Justice Scalia, after all, had been a dominant presence on the court, where his influence sometimes exceeded the weight of his single vote. On top of this, the court faced the prospect of functioning for an undetermined and conceivably extensive period of time with a complement of only eight justices, that is, with an even-numbered bench instead of the usual nine. The situation posed the question whether the justices would be hopelessly deadlocked or whether they could function effectively as a party of eight. Well, what happened? As the court finished its term at the end of June, the record pointed more to business as usual than to stalemate. By my count, only four of the term's 69 rulings were decided 4-4, split down the middle. You might ask, well, what happens when there's a tie? Who wins? In such situations, the court issues no opinion and merely affirms the decision of the court below. In other words, if you were the winner before the case got to the Supreme Court, you remain the winner. Of those four cases that were decided 4-4, only two were actually decided after Justice Scalia's death. Each, however, posed a question of major national importance that was thus left without an authoritative ruling. 
Some who are troubled by an even-numbered bench forget that the court at its beginning in 1789, way back when, was staffed by only six justices. In other words, when Congress created the court way, way back, 1789, they said, well, we're going to start with six justices. In the years since, the court's roster, which is fixed by Congress, has gone down, and it's gone up and down. Between 1789 and 1869, for example, Congress changed the number of justices from six to five, from five to six, six to seven, seven to nine, nine to 10, and 10 to seven, and seven to nine. And the number of authorized justices has remained fixed at nine since, say, 1869. So if an even-numbered bench in the modern era has been both unusual and perhaps less than desirable, it is nonetheless hardly unprecedented, even aside from the occasions when a justice has been absent because of illness. For example, eight months lapsed between the retirement of Justice Powell in 1987 and the arrival of Justice Kennedy, who of course is on the current court, in February of 1988. In recent court history, so lengthily an interval has been exceeded only by the full year that elapsed between Justice Fortas's resignation in May of 1969 and the swearing in of Justice Blackmun in June of 1970. Although even that span fell short of the leave of absence Justice Jackson had from the court at the president's request from May of 1945 until October 1946. That's a stretch. When Jackson was the chief US prosecutor at the Nuremberg war crimes trials at the end of World War II. Nonetheless, the even-numbered bench in 2016 created a novel situation for the remaining justices. This is important because none was on the court prior to Justice Kennedy's arrival. In other words, this post scalia environment of an even-numbered bench presents an entirely new world for every current member of the court. So how do we get back to our familiar party of nine? A look at the Constitution gives us the answer. As uh, the Constitution reads, the President shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court. Notice the two-step process. First, the President nominates or proposes someone, and then after the Senate has conferred its approval, the appointment to the bench is complete. And in modern times, the Senate's process is also in two steps. First, the Senate's Committee on the Judiciary holds what sometimes can be lengthy, very lengthy hearings on the nominee, after which the nomination moves to the Senate floor, usually for a debate that's then followed by a vote. If the full Senate gives the thumbs up, then the nominee takes the oaths of office and then fills the empty seat on the bench. Sometimes presidents move quickly to fill a Supreme Court vacancy, but sometimes presidents dilly-dally. Take, for example, what happened not long after Bill Clinton began his first term as president in January 1993. On March 19 that year, Justice White, who had been named to the bench by Justice Kennedy in 1962, announced his intention to retire. At this point, the wheels of the justice picking machinery began to turn in the White House. But it was not until June 14, about three months after White's announcement, that Clinton made known his choice for the court. And that would, of course, be Ruth Ginsburg, who was a judge then on the US Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. And of course, Justice Ginsburg is still very much a member of the current eight justice court. So to fill Justice Scalia's seat, President Obama did not follow the uh, stretched out Clinton timetable. He moved in a bit over four weeks, announcing on March 16 his choice of Merrick Garland. Garland, who is 63, has been chief judge of the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit 
since 2013. Now, by way of reference, when we hear talk of a U.S. Court of Appeals, this refers to one of the 12 regional appellate courts in the federal court system. You have the trial courts in the federal court system that are called district courts, so if we had an organizational chart, think of that at the bottom. You've got the Supreme Court at the top, and between the district court and the Supreme Court, you have these things that we call the courts of appeals. So Judge Garland then is a member of the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Pennsylvania, for example, happens to be in the Third Circuit along with uh, Delaware and New Jersey. But because of the kinds of cases it decides, the D.C. Circuit, uh, where Garland sits, is usually considered second in importance only to the Supreme Court itself. Now, Obama's Harvard-educated nominee was named to that court in 1997 by President Clinton and approved by the Democratic-controlled Senate 76 to 23 in a vote that included support from 30 Republicans. In 2016, however, after Justice Scalia's death, President Obama faced a Senate control not by Democrats, but by Republicans. And the Republican leadership in the Senate insisted very quickly that they would not act on any nomination for Scalia's seat, and hence on the future direction of the court, until after the people had spoken in the November election. In other words, we entered new political territory without a map or GPS. Now, to justify doing nothing, Majority Leader Mitchell McConnell and Judiciary Committee Chair Charles Grassley referred to a speech in the Senate made by none other than Vice President Joe Biden in June of 1992, which of course was an election year, during the administration of President George H.W. Bush. When then Senator Biden, he's vice president now, but this was back when he was a senator, was chair of the Judiciary Committee. And this is what then Senator Biden said. It is my view that if a Supreme Court justice resigns tomorrow or within the next several weeks or resigns at the end of the summer, President Bush should consider following the practice of a majority of his predecessors and not, and he emphasized again, and not name a nominee until after the November election is completed. It is my view, he went on, that if the president presses an election year nomination, the Senate Judiciary Committee should seriously consider not scheduling confirmation hearings on the nomination until after the political campaign season is over. Now, with Garland's nomination being ignored by the Senate, Vice President Biden has insisted that Republicans were taking his words out of context. But of course, Biden still had to admit that the words were his. And of course, that along came the warning that they uh, embodied. Besides, as the Garland nomination continued to languish, Republicans had another reason not to accommodate the president. They had not forgotten that then-Senator Obama had participated in an unsuccessful filibuster in early 2006 to block a vote on Judge Samuel Alito's nomination to the Supreme Court. The Senate Judiciary Committee had approved Alito's nomination by a vote of 10 to 6 and then had sent it to the full Senate. What Senator Obama and a few collaborators wanted to do was to prevent the full Senate from ever even taking a vote on Alito. So why was Obama's action then so relevant today? It's relevant because in politics, memories sometimes run long as well as very deep. Now, it has been 203 days since President Obama announced his choice for the high court. The resulting standoff and political maneuverings over Scalia's seat continue as a vivid reminder that Supreme Court justices are not merely lawyers who wear robes, but major players whose distinctive work in interpreting the Constitution and statutes helps to shape American government 
in the political life of the nation. For example, even though the term uh, began at the Supreme Court just on Monday, so we're just now into the new October 16 term, the Supreme Court has in recent weeks shown that it is hardly going to be a, ba a, a bystander. I'm referring in particular to a voting rights case from North Carolina that will come up for discussion again later in today's program. It's called NAACP versus McCrory. That's McCrory as in the current governor of North Carolina. I mention it here because what happened with that case at the court very much reflects Scalia's absence and its impact on justice. Here's the background. On July 29 this year, the Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit struck down voting law changes that had been enacted in North Carolina in 2013 by a Republican-led state legislature. Specifically, the state had shortened the early voting period by a full week, eliminated same-day registration, none of which, by the way, we have in Pennsylvania, prohibited provisional ballots cast out of precinct from being counted, expanded the ability of to, uh, to, to challenge voters, eliminated a pre-registration program for 16 and 17 year olds, and implemented a strict voter ID requirement. So, in the words of the appeals court in looking at these uh, voting changes, as the judges said, the new provisions target African Americans with almost surgical precision and impose cures for problems that did not exist. Thus, the asserted justifications cannot and do not conceal the state's true motivation. And what was the true motivation that was suspected? The appeals panel concluded that the procedures were designed to hinder voting by blacks who, by the way, vote overwhelmingly for the Democratic Party. The state of North Carolina then asked the Supreme Court to allow the law to remain in effect while the state pursued a routine appeal to the high court. In other words, just sort of put it on the back burner, let the law go into it or stay in effect, and then we're gonna see if we can convince you people to overturn what the Fourth Circuit did. Um, but on August 31, the court divided evenly 4-4 on North Carolina's petition, the result being to leave in place the Fourth Circuit slapped down for at least the time being. Had Justice, uh, Justice Scalia still been on the court, the vote probably would have been 5-4 in North Carolina's favor, allowing the 2013 voting rules to remain in force at least well into November. So, why was this non-action by the court on August 31 so important and so urgent? It was both important and urgent because the case was as much about timing as about anything else. Why else would the state engage specialty, high-powered, and by the way, super expensive legal talent in the form of a recent and very gifted solicitor general to defend the law. I do not think the state necessarily thought that the Supreme Court would ultimately have reached findings opposite that of the Fourth Circuit had the court allowed the voting changes to go into effect until a formal appeal could be heard later in the term. Frankly, that really did not matter. Instead, what I want you to think about is election day, which is just 34 days away. So think election day and think battleground state. North Carolina went for Obama in 2008, but it went for Romney in 2012. Its 15 electoral votes are especially important for Republican candidate Donald Trump as he tries to put together a combination of states that will yield the magic number of 270 electoral votes, and with that, the keys to the front door of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And there's more. Aside from there being a race for governor in North Carolina that's nip and tuck, don't forget the U.S. Senate. 
Republicans currently have a majority of 54, 46 in that upper chamber. And it is the Senate that will ultimately have the final say on who sits in Scalia's seat. North Carolina is one of several states with very close Senate races this year. A black voter turnout that has not been artificially depressed raises the odds of a Democratic win in that contest and therefore improves the chances the Democrats take control of the Senate in January. So the August 31st non-action by the Supreme Court, when it was minus Scalia, now makes that a bit more likely. So what's the takeaway point? Hold on. Justice Scalia's absence continues to have its effects. So it's one of these stories that's just in the process of unfolding. So we just have to kind of wait and see how this all plays out. But we're getting to see some exciting stuff that's really happening kind of for the first time. So thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to thank Millersville University for hosting this conference and to Professor Glazier for putting together this um, conference on justice and for Pro Professor Glenn for kind of putting the panel together. Uh, it's a pleasure being back at Millersville University. It's hard to believe it's been, you know, like Dr. Glenn said, 21 years since I was uh, first in his class. But it's a, it's a joy and it's a pleasure to be um, speaking about the Supreme Court and speaking about justice with Professor Stevenson and, and Professor Glenn. Believe it or not, things I have to say today actually relate to something that Dr. Glenn taught uh, me and my classmates back in 1995, but I'll get to that in a few minutes. But uh, as, as Professor Glenn mentioned, we will be discussing some of the specifics regarding the 2015 Supreme Court term and looking ahead to the 2016 term as well. So before we get into some of those highlights, and there are a lot of highlights, I believe, I, I wanted to briefly talk about a debate that occurs within the Supreme Court that the media very rarely addresses, but it is an issue that directly relates to justice. So this debate about justice is, a, is an internal debate that the conservatives on the court, on the Roberts Court, are engaged in. And the death of Justice Antonin Scalia in February of 16 will have a significant impact on this debate and how the Supreme Court debates issue, issues of justice. Um, and so what, I, what I'm going to say today, you can kind of, I, I think, you could disagree, but you, you could think of this, um, the way I set this up, as a lens through which you can evaluate and assess Supreme Court opinions. So when I first took uh, Professor Glenn, um, one of the things he taught us was that when you read a Supreme Court opinion, a Supreme Court decision, you should probably forget about the specific names to the case. I mean, it's important that you remember the name come exam time and, and what the court ruled. But the, the parties to the lawsuit are often irrelevant. Um, I don't think that's the case so much anymore. So think of it this way. When the Supreme Court decides to hear a case, there are two parties to the suit, a, a petitioner and a respondent. And the justices have to make a decision regarding whether the decision they hand down will apply to just those parties, which is what would be called a very narrow ruling or a very incremental ruling, or whether they will decide the matter with, and whether they will craft a, a, a widely applicable legal rule that will extend to perhaps the entire nation. So let me just give you a couple of examples. You're, you may be familiar with Bush v. Gore, a 2000 decision that halted the manual recount efforts in parts of Florida that essentially secured the Electoral College victory to George W. Bush. In the per curiam opinion in that case, the justices made it clear that the decision was only applicable to the case before them. So the justices wrote, quote, our consideration is limited to the present circumstances. In other words, this decision only applies to Bush and Gore in this election. So that is what is called a narrow ruling, a very incremental ruling. On the other hand, many of us can name and even discuss some major decisions handed down by the US Supreme Court decisions that resulted in major public policy shifts in American life. 
So Brown v. Board of Education probably comes to mind, dealing with segregation in schools, Roe versus Wade and abortion, Matt v. Ohio with the exclusionary rule, Miranda versus Arizona, which is enjoying its 50 year anniversary this year. So the Supreme Court that makes big splashes, the Supreme Court that fundamentally changes American society, the Supreme Court that rules that no state can deny marriage to same sex couples, the Supreme Court that lands itself on the front page of the New York Times is the institution that is in the minds of Americans and is the subject of many high school teacher lesson plans. But what I want to talk about is the other Supreme Court, the Supreme Court that chooses to have very different notions of justice. So this different notion of justice is what's called incrementalism, handing down decisions that only apply in a very limited fashion, sometimes to simply the parties to the lawsuit. And so this incrementalism, I believe, comes from at least three different sources. First, in situations where there are two camps, a liberal camp and a conservative camp on the court, with perhaps one or maybe two justices in the middle, otherwise known as the swing justice, it will be more difficult to piece together a five-member majority. So in order to keep a five-member majority in place, the justices will have to compromise and give up their optimal preference in exchange for something more amenable to the median justice in the current court as Justice Kennedy. The second major factor in the Supreme Court incrementalism can be tied to Chief Justice John Roberts' leadership style. So when John Roberts testified before the, judiciary, the Senate Judiciary Committee in, 20, in 2005, he commented that one of his goals as Chief Justice was to increase the number of unanimous opinions. And he has accomplished this. If you look at the last three terms, the unanimous opinions are anywhere within the range of 40 to 63 percent of the last three terms have been unanimous. But I would argue that this unanimity comes at a very steep cost. And that cost is um, not handing down decisions that are widely applicable. And the reason is that when the Chief Justice is trying to piece together a unanimous opinion, the Chief Justice has to listen to the concerns and the desires and the policy preferences of eight, now seven, different justices. So therefore, to get unanimous agreement, the justices usually agree on something very narrow. Lastly, I think it's fair to say that the conservatives on the court, which would include Roberts, Alito, uh, Kennedy, Thomas, and then before he died, Scalia. The conservatives on this court disagree fundamentally about the role of the Supreme Court in American society. So remember that when I listed some of the major Supreme Court decisions that fundamentally impact in American life, abortion, exclusionary rule, reading suspects their constitutional rights, these were liberal, quote unquote, liberal opinions. So it is more difficult, we can do it, but it's more difficult to list the major conservative opinions of the Roberts Court. We can talk about Citizens United, of course that would probably be the case that you would say is a major conservative Supreme Court decision, but even that decision stands out, I would argue, because it started out in a very incremental way. It took the Supreme Court a long time to get to the Citizens United decision. So some justices on the court, Thomas Scalia before he passed away, believe that the court should not be shy about declaring what is just or what is right, and they encourage the court to move very swiftly on matters that are important to conservatives. And so in some ways, this is a very activist court mentality. Uh, Justice Thomas is really not shy about this at all. Um, he, he's, he's not shy about overruling precedent and, and kind of leading the country in a very conservative fashion. On the other hand, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito, to some degree Justice Kennedy, believe that the Supreme Court should not be in the business of fundamentally altering American life with judicial pronouncements. Their preference, in a lot of cases, is to leave that up to the other branches, the legislative branch and the executive branch. So this judicial philosophy of Roberts and Alito lead them often to different places than Scalia and Thomas. So let me just give you two examples from this past term. Um, we'll talk about them more in, more in detail in a couple of minutes. So the first one is the Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin. 
Uh, it's otherwise known as Fisher Part 2. And the reason is that there is a Fisher Part 1. And Fisher 1 was a 2013 Supreme Court case. And so this case involves affirmative action policies at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, many liberal activists, or many you know, liberal, liberals in politics were concerned that the Supreme Court would overturn an important law school affirmative action case called Grutter versus Bollinger from 2003 that allowed for law schools to take race into account in their admissions decisions. However, what the court did in 2013 in Fisher Part 1 is that the court decided, uh, the court only decided the very narrow question of what legal standard the lower courts should use in assessing the legality of university-led affirmative action uh, programs. And so the court ruled that the correct standard is strict scrutiny. We'll talk about that uh, in a couple of minutes. So what happened in 2013, because of this incremental decision, is that affirmative action lived uh, another day. In fact, it lived um, at least for another three years, and we'll, we'll see here in a couple of minutes that it's, uh, it's going to live much longer. Um, but what, what happened as a result of that narrow ruling is that Chief Justice Roberts was able to get six other justices to agree. However, Justices Scalia and Thomas filed concurring opinions in which they argued that the court should have overruled Grutter and that university-led affirmative action programs were in violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. So when this case, Fisher, made its way back to the Supreme Court in the 2015 term, many observers believed that Roberts, Alito, and Kennedy would join Thomas and Scalia to end affirmative action in public universities. And there are many reasons why we believe that. Um, one reason being that Justice Kennedy has never, uh, as, far, as far as I know, has never been in the camp of, of upholding affirmative action in, in education. So we can discuss what happened in that case, but incrementalism backfired in Fisher Part Two because Justice Kennedy decided to side with the court's more liberal justices and uphold the university's affirmative action admissions policy. Another case, and I actually believe that all four cases kind of relate to this incrementalism, but one other case is a case dealing with essentially the exclusionary rule, uh, and it's called Utah versus Streif. So for the last 30 plus years, many conservatives have been arguing that the exclusionary rule is a bad rule. Exclusionary rule is the rule that when police violate the Fourth Amendment, that evidence should be thrown out. Uh, and so as Dr. Glenn Professor Stevenson well know, many conservatives have been arguing that this rule should go. The court has been tinkering with this for a long time. They had the opportunity in 2006 to get rid of the exclusionary rule. However, they handed down a ruling that was very narrow and very limited and chose not to. In the Utah versus Streif case, uh, they had another opportunity to get rid of the exclusionary rule and they decided not to. I also believe, and I'll conclude with this, that that with the court being split 4-4, Chief Justice Roberts has a decision. Chief Justice Roberts does not want many decisions handed down with a 4-4. And so what will he do to ensure that decisions will not be decided 4-4? My prediction, we'll see if I'm correct, but my, my prediction is that he will work every possible avenue to ensure that decisions are not decided 4-4, which means that the decisions they hand down will be very narrow uh, and, and will not mean a whole lot for larger American life. Thank you. I will lay out the basics of the case. Uh, Professor Stevenson will tackle the rationale of the majority and Professor uh, Kreider will tackle uh, the dissent. If there's something in this discussion that you don't understand, we're all comfortable treating this like a class. We're not comfortable treating you like students, but we're comfortable treating this like a class. If, if you have a question as we proceed, uh, all you need to do is raise your hand and we'll stop, pause, and make certain that you understand uh, where we're going. We're also going to do our best uh, to stay out of the weeds. We understand that not all of you in here are preparing to go to law school uh, and that Many of these cases are decided in the weeds. We'll explain what we think you need to know to understand the case, and then we'll be happy to attempt to answer any questions you might have. And along the way, we might incorporate some of what you heard from Professor Stevens.
Stevenson, what, what are the effects of Scalia's absence on this particular case? And I think we can even demonstrate in some of the opinions that uh, Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, and others are pushing the court to go big, where in some cases they may be restrained by the Chief Justice who's wanting the court uh, to go small. So we'll start with an issue that's very familiar to all of you, affirmative action. Uh, the facts of Fisher versus University of Texas are as follows. Years ago, the University of Texas adopted an admissions policy with two components. The first component is what's called the top 10% rule. Any individual who graduated in the top 10% of her or his class at a Texas high school received automatic admission to the University of Texas at Austin. You graduate top 10%, you're in. The second component was designed to fill the remaining seats. And the University of Texas suggested that about 75% of its seats were filled by those top 10% percent graduates. For the remaining quarter of the freshman class, the University of Texas considered two things, an academic index and a personal achievement index. The academic index was limited to how well you had done academically to include your high school grade point average as well as your scores on the SAT. The personal achievement index dealt with a host of factors, too numerous to mention, but including race. Abigail Fisher did not challenge, per se, the constitutionality of the top 10 practice. She did not challenge the constitutionality of the academic index portion. She believed, simply, that the University of Texas should not consider an individual applicant's race when considering whether to admit that individual to the university. The Supreme Court held by a vote of four to three. Now, four plus three is seven, and seven isn't nine. We know we're down one because Justice Scalia died after oral argument, but prior to the court announcing its decision. A second justice, Elena Kagan, did not participate in this decision because she had had some involvement in this matter when she uh, was a Solicitor General of the United States. So we have a case decided not by nine justices, but by seven. And by a vote of four to three, the Supreme Court upheld the admissions policy. More specifically, the Supreme Court upheld the use of the personal achievement score, meaning that universities may take into consideration an applicant's race. Professor Stevenson, can you talk briefly about the sure. majority opinion there? Sure. Uh, actually, just to go back and connect with something that uh, Dr. Kreider talked about with uh, the, uh, the reference to strict scrutiny. Yeah. Uh, lots of times when the Supreme Court is trying to decide whether certain classifications, that is laws or policies that treat people differently, uh, whether that's acceptable or not, uh, their most demanding standard, and they've really sort of got two or three uh, that they use, they're, the most demanding standard is one called strict scrutiny, which says that uh, that the, that the uh, objective, that is, whatever you're trying to achieve has got to be compelling, and that the means that you've chosen to do that have got to be narrowly tailored. That is, it's got to, you know, sort of target so you're doing that and really nothing, nothing else. So the, the sort of legal mumbo jumbo that's, uh, that's sort of behind this case has to do with this standard of strict scrutiny. Now, just a little bit of background on this. Uh, the first time the Supreme Court ever really waded into the issue of affirmative action at the college level was in 1978, 
in a case that involved a, a man, young man who would try to go to medical school called Alan Bakke. Um, in that case, the court for the first time, and it was kind of cloudy, but there were five votes on the court for saying that uh, if the objective of affirmative action is that you are trying to achieve diversity, the court regarded the idea of diversity in an educational setting and environment as something that was compelling. So the idea was, well, if diversity is compelling and what you're doing is designed to achieve diversity, then, then maybe this will get by on the basis of strict scrutiny. Okay, so that was in 1978. They don't touch college affirmative action issues again for, what, 25 years. It's not until 2003. And I think the reference was made earlier to the Grutter case. This was, re this was from the University of Michigan. And this was a five to four decision by the Supreme Court uh, where the court upheld the use of race in a whole, shall we say, a holistic admissions policy at the University of Michigan, Michigan Law School. At the same time, they upheld the use of race in affirmative action at the law school at the University of Michigan. In another case called the Gratz case, they struck down the use of race in undergraduate admissions because it looked too much like a quota in the way that the University of Michigan was doing it. So Gratz looked in one direction, which was against affirmative action, and Grutter looked favorably on it. On the it, same day, by the, the way. On the same day. The cases yeah. came down yeah. on the same day. <laughs> Put yourself in the position of a Supreme Court justice. You do this one morning. You go home that evening. You're sitting around the dinner table, and your spouse looks at you, or your son or your daughter, and says, Daddy, what'd you do at the court today? And you say, we went in both directions <laughs> at the same time, really within a period, probably about a half hour of each other. So it's an amazing way to earn a living. <laughs> um, but, the, but the point in the, in the Grutter case is that Justice Kennedy dissented. He dissented from the five votes that upheld the University of Michigan plan. So what's interesting then about the Fisher case is, if you kind of look at how the justices have come down on these things, Kennedy as, as was said, sort of switch sides. That he was against accepting the University of Michigan's use of race um, in this holistic review, but in the Fisher case, where Texas was doing a, I guess what we would call a sort of holistic approach, certainly wasn't a quota system, um, he said this is fine. Um, so how long it's gonna be before we get another sort of college admission affirmative action case, who knows? But it seems to me that, that Fisher, at least with the current makeup, the court is very dispositive on that question. That as long as a college or university stays away from anything that smells like or looks like or walks like or talks like a quota, but you're using race as a factor of lots of other factors, you can probably do it acceptably under the Constitution. Um, I don't want to get into the dissent because I want to hear what Professor Kreider has to say about that. But that gives you kind of a sense of, of what's going in, and this is why the Fisher case is important. Now, what difference does Scalia's absence make in the case? Um, had Scalia been on the court, I, I think pretty certain he would have voted uh, in favor of Fisher, that is, against the University of Texas. But again, because of the way the court was divided, it would have been a five, it would have been a 4-4 a, a court. And that would have upheld the decision of the Court of Appeals below, which had gone in favor of the University of Texas. So Scalia's absence in the Fisher case really made no difference. Now, what we don't know is, had Scalia been there, 
had he been sitting around the table in the Supreme Court's conference room when they really talk about this stuff, Scalia could be pretty powerful. He was not what you would call a shrinking violent. Um, he was not only a big man in terms of his physical size, but he made his positions very, very known. So in a kind of eyeball to eyeball kind of discussion, or when you get draft opinions, and those opinions start circulating and Scalia starts marking somebody's up, you don't know what, for instance, Scalia's presence might have done, say, to Kennedy on this. That's just one of those kind of big question marks that's hanging out there and that we'll never have an answer to on that. I think so, I'll, I'll add to that. Yeah. Um, I, I think Scalia's absence in this case is significant. <laughs> um, Professor Stevenson is right. Had he been there, the vote would have been four to four. The University of Texas won in the appellate court. But a 4-4 split on the Supreme Court does not set any precedent. Yeah. And one of the things that comes out of this case, for the first time, the Supreme Court recognizes that the benefits that flow from a diverse student body comprise a compelling state interest. Up to this point, and, and I, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but the court had really been fractured on whether affirmative action policies ought to be judged under the strict scrutiny standard, which demands a compelling state interest, or a much lower standard, a rational basis question, uh, w which allows uh, greater uses of things. But race has always been, I shouldn't say always, ra race has been for the last generation at least, one of the categories where the court has said merits strict scrutiny. I don't think there's any doubt where Scalia would have been had he been alive. You agree? I absolutely And, agree. and where would that have been, Professor Kreider? <laughs> uh, well, Scalia would have been with the, uh, with the Alito um, camp in this, um, but we never would have known what you know, they, they wrote because they would have just handed down a, a one or two sentence uh, decision. But so the dissent, there were three justices in dissent. You had Justice Alito, Chief Justice Roberts, and Justice Thomas. Um, there are a couple of interesting factoids, if you will, about this uh, dissent. Number one, uh, the dissent, the Alito dissent is 51 pages long. The Kennedy opinion is 20, and Kennedy ignores it. Um, you know, now Kennedy, I refer to him as the poet pastor, justice on the court. <laughs> He's not the greatest legal scholar. Uh, reading his opinions is like reading a mainline uh, denomination sermon. Um, so, I mean, we, we, you know, who knows why he chose to do that, but his opinion, so the dissent that's written by Alito, let me just read the first sentence and it, and it says pretty much everything. Alito wrote, something strange has happened since our prior decision in this case, meaning Fisher won. And so that something strange is something we've already discussed and that is, hey, Kennedy wrote the majority opinion in Fisher won. He was in the dissent in the law school admission, uh, law school affirmative action case back in 2003. Um, now he's now with the majority, um, with very little convincing analysis as to why he is in the majority. So Alito kind of slams him for that. Um, Alito is also very critical of the court because. The University of Texas is not allowed to have a number attached to this is when we know we have enough uh, minority students in our, in our classes. And that, that the reason is that's a quota. The court has said that quotas are impermissible. Um, so the University of Texas refers to a critical mass of students. They need a critical mass. And the reason they use that language is because they can't attach a number to it. So Alito says, you know, how do you know when you have reached a critical mass of minority students in your college population? Um, so he accuses the majority of not, of not having a limiting, a limiting principle. Uh, there's really no way to know. For example, is it the demographics of Texas? So, you know, if Texas is, let's, I'm just picking a number, if Texas is 18% African American, does that mean that Texas should or is searching for 18% uh, African American in their student population? Well, that really can't be because there could be a university from New Mexico that right, has 
there could be 8% African Americans, so their critical mass would be 8%, and so the, the number would fluctuate from state to state. So Alito essentially accuses the court of just manipulating um, the facts in this case to reach a decision that they wanted to reach, one that was very popular, which is a nice segue into Justice Thomas's dissent. Thomas wrote a dissent. It's two paragraphs long. And he calls this affirmative action uh, a fad. Um, and he says that the Constitution does not allow classifications based on race. And what the University of Texas is doing is they are classifying their students by race. And the Constitution does not allow that. So that's essentially the dissent. So you, you, you see there, just to piggyback on what Professor Kreider said a few minutes ago, you, uh, Alito and Thomas wanting to go big, wanting to go bold. No, affirmative action programs are unconstitutional, period. Whether they're narrowly tailored, broadly tailored, it makes no difference. Race should not be considered, period. One thing, that. yeah, it's, you know, I think when you get into the issue of affirmative action as, as well as some other race-related questions, uh, it's sort of, I think a useful way to think about this is that if you go back, you know, 100 years plus a little bit, that, that we've sort of had two, two ways of thinking about what the Constitution and what the law to do on this. And, you know, you've got on the one hand what you could might call, and this would be, say, reflected in, in Justice Thomas's position, the non-discrimination principle that, that essentially starts with the understanding that race is simply too toxic, it's too dangerous, don't even think about it, don't even, you know, imagine going down that road that it is so toxic, it is so dangerous that you cannot trust policy makers, you cannot trust judges, you cannot trust educators, you cannot trust legislators, whoever, to make wise decisions when it comes to that. So it's just like a hot stove, you know, don't, don't touch it. The other sort of way to look at this is what you might call benign discrimination that says that, yeah, there are dangers here, but properly done, using race can accomplish lots of good things. And so it's sort of been a tug of war over the years between people who say, yeah, you can trust judges or legislators or educators to wisely and beneficially use race versus those who say, don't even think about it. And the, the ones who say, don't even think about it, would go back and say, well, if you go back several decades, people used to justify racial segregation, you know, saying blacks go to this school and whites go to this school by law, because you know the understanding was, well, gee whiz, everybody was better off. And so they say, well, look where that brought you. So I think that's sort of a useful way to compartmentalize the different positions in these affirmative action cases in terms of and, and that we see it on the court itself. Second case we want to talk about is one that involves driving under the influence of alcohol. This was a collection of three cases decided by the court just this past June, all raising a similar question. Most of you know or if you don't know, you should because you signed off on this, that when you obtain your driver's license in the state of Pennsylvania, you are implicitly consenting to be tested for alcohol when you operate a motor vehicle. And if you choose not at the time of your detention to consent, the penalty is you forfeit your license. That's a standard policy in all states of the Union. A number of states, however, didn't think that was enough, that losing your license wasn't a sufficient deterrent to drinking and driving. So a number of states, including North Dakota, decided that if you refused to consent, there were additional criminal penalties that could be lodged against you. This case deals with two separate means of testing. The most common method is a breath analysis. 
But some states require that you consent to having your blood be drawn. And in this particular case, dividing five to three, the court said that breath tests were constitutional without a warrant, but that blood tests weren't. The court drew a distinction between breath and blood. I don't think this is a case that would have come out any differently had Justice Scalia been alive. The vote here was five to three. It makes no difference on which side Scalia would have been, although he could have proven persuasive, of course, to some other justices. So Professor Stevens, you want to tackle quickly the distinction between breath analysis and blood analysis? Well, I mean, it comes down to the difference between, you know, blowing into something and, and having your skin pricked. Um, that's at one level. That's a very, very simple level. And the court, I think, in you know, the majority position was that, that this, is, this is a difference, um, that, that blood testing is much more bodily intrusive. Every one of us at the moment is either probably inhaling or exhaling. So we are exchanging air in this room. So you are voluntarily releasing things from your lungs into the atmosphere in this room. Um, so to collect what comes out of someone's lungs uh, through the mouth then doesn't really intrude very much on bodily integrity. It doesn't intrude on it all. Whereas drawing blood, you know, you go to the doctor's office and they want to, you know, do a, a CMP, complete metabolic panel, check your sugar level, your cholesterol, da 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 da. You know, they get the thing around it and they poke it in there. And if they miss the vein, they got to do it again. And then you come out with a black and blue. It happened to me last week. I know all about that. Okay. Um, well, but then you say, what's what's been collected? The air gives them pretty much just the the alcohol level however that's, that's measured. But then think about what your blood reveals. That the officer who has made the stop is interested really at that moment in only one thing, and that is, are you legally intoxicated? But think about all the things that could be learned from your blood, and who's got it? Where is that information going to go? So the, the notion was that breath test is much less a violation of privacy. In fact, it's hardly any at all than is an actual uh, blood test, given both the difference in intrusiveness in the body as well as the, you know, what can actually be done with it. Now, you have to sort of put that in perspective because it hasn't been that many years ago in a case from Maryland that the court upheld the use of taking DNA samples when a person is arrested. Um, well, taking the DNA sample is, is pretty simple. That's not a breath test, but it doesn't involve very much. Um, but think about what your DNA can tell about you. You find out your ancestral connections in terms of which part of the world you, know, you can trace your roots back through. So, the court was on record as having said that, okay, the DNA, and then if you go back even, even further, there was a case, Cup against Murphy, where they took fingernail samples from a person. Again, it's a bit gross to think about, uh, particularly if somebody is not especially hygienic. But again, not much in the way of bodily intrusion, but you can learn a lot. And in this case, it was enough to kind of send somebody to jail in terms of what had been collected under the fingernails. So it's, it's an interesting case, I think, obviously important for law enforcement, mm -hmm. very important for law enforcement. But I think it's also an interesting case because of the window it gives you into all the various things that government has tried or might try or does try <coughs> to do in terms of acquiring information about us. It's not easy to explain to the layperson why a search incident to arrest that results in uh, a breath test 
is okay. A cheek swab to collect DNA is okay, but a blood test isn't. Um, there were no true dissenters here uh, in the sense that all of the three uh, who refused to sign on to the court's opinion concurred in part and dissented in part. So without throwing too much, I don't know that we need to get too deep in those weeds, but um, the, the counter argument that, yeah. that, that police ought to be allowed to take blood tests of individuals who are detained for driving under the influence. Right, so the, there was an opinion written by Sotomayor uh, that Ginsburg joined, and so they agreed, uh, those two justices agreed with the majority that the uh, warrantless testing of the blood test was, was not permissible, so they agreed on that. What they disagreed on was the breath uh, an analysis. And so what they said, in order to understand what they argued, you kind of have to understand what the majority opinion said with, with respect to these tests and determining whether they're in fact constitutional. They say, we need to look at the government's interest on the one hand, and on the other hand, we need to look at the individual's privacy interest. And so they disagreed about the the government interest in the warrantless breath test. And so Sotomayor made the point that when the police arrest someone and want to do a breath test, that it usually takes within the range of 45 minutes to two hours to take the person back to the station and conduct the breath test. So they said that you know, they need to calibrate the machines, they need to take out off the, the plastic piece on the breathalyzer, put a new one on, test it again. And so she says that you know, on, if you watch it on TV, you think that this occurs in a very small time frame, when in fact it could take up to two hours. So she said, since it takes up to two hours, that's a pretty good period of time that the government could get a warrant. So she accuses the government of simply saying, this is a matter of convenience. Uh, yeah, we could get a warrant, but it's just simply more convenient not to. Uh, so she argued that you know, convenience should not be a kind of an issue here with the breath test. So she, uh, or the two female justices disagree with the majority on that. Then there's an opinion written by Thomas, and I think this is important, and I'm glad we talked about this before the, the exclusionary rule case, because Thomas, keep this in mind, Thomas says uh, he, was, he would be in favor of the warrantless breath test and blood, okay? And the reason is he says the police need a a bright line. They need a rule that they can follow. Uh, and so he said, you know, lower courts will be confused by this, not just the lay person, but also lower courts. And he says it's not fair to the police because they need to think about the context, all of the facts of the particular stop. And he said that's simply not fair when they're doing their job. So he's arguing for a bright line, and the bright line should be that the police are allowed to do the warrantless blood and breath test. And I also think it's important to emphasize, it's, I mean, it, 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 it's been mentioned, but I think it's a good thing to get it squarely out on the table, that what this was about was the blood test without the warrant. That, that it was not an issue it, that, as to whether or not you could do a blood test. The question was, do you have to get a judge's permission? That's, that's really what it came down to yeah. on that. So the word warrantless was, was sort of critical uh, in this. Now we move to a dispute that divides the men and the women on the Supreme Court. Another Fourth Amendment case in which all three of the dissenters were women. The facts of this case are relatively simple. A police officer suspects via an anonymous tip that there's drug activity taking place at a particular location. He agrees from time to time to go check out what's taking place. He sees a fellow leave the place. Doesn't see the fellow enter. He sees the fellow leave the place. He follows the fellow. He confronts him at some sort of convenience store and asks him to produce identification. The individual produces identification. The police officer runs a background check, discovers that there is an outstanding warrant for his arrest, a relatively minor violation, but nonetheless an outstanding warrant. On the basis of that information, the officer arrests the individual, Streif, and then conducts a warrantless search incident to the arrest. 
and you know what he discovers on the body, evidence of illegal drug activity. So the question before the court becomes whether the evidence obtained as a result of the stop violated the Fourth Amendment, which protects you from unreasonable searches and seizures. Now, curiously here, there's very little dispute over whether the stop was legitimate. There's widespread agreement that the stop probably wasn't legitimate. He didn't see the fellow enter the home. He only saw the fellow exit. He had no information that would confirm the individual was engaged in any legal activity. He simply stopped and asked the individual for identification. But prior to conducting the search, the officer discovered the warrant. Therefore, the search was predicated not upon the stop, but rather upon the discovery of the warrant. What court watchers call the attenuation doctrine of the exclusionary rule. So the court is asked to decide here whether the evidence obtained as a result of a bad stop is admissible because the bad stop is made good, excuse me, because the search is made good by the discovery of a warrant. Yeah, that's, it's a, it's really sort of amazing sort of case because there's general agreement that probably the police officer acted improperly. That is to say that he really had no constitutionally acceptable basis for ever engaging this person in conversation in the first place. Um, so you start the thing with an illegal act. The illegal act, as Professor Glenn said, then leads to the discovery that there's a warrant out for this person's arrest. So the police officer then now has a basis to arrest the individual. Having arrested him, police procedure, and it's been upheld numerous times by the Supreme Court, police procedure then allows the arresting officer to conduct a search of the person, and they usually add the area under the person's control to make sure that the person is not armed or that there's some, you know, not loss of evidence. It's in the process of this search incident to arrest based upon the discovery of the outstanding warrant, which of course had nothing to do with what's happened to point, that you then discover that he's got all sorts of stuff in his pockets that he ought not to have. So the question then comes back to does the initial, you might say poison, pollute the whole thing or is the initial poison in somehow uh, 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 sufficiently diluted by the later discovery of the outstanding arrest warrant, which of course would justify the search of the person. So the things that he's actually arrested for in, you know, to start with have, have nothing to do with what the arrest warrant was about. Um, it just happened to fall into place that way. Um, so I think it's another good indication of the trouble that the exclusionary rule is in. And, and it's been in some kind of difficulty almost from the very, very beginning when the Supreme Court applied it to uh, state uh, 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 law enforcement going all the way back to 1961, 1962. Um, and from time to time, the court comes out with these rulings that in effect create kind of an exception. Um, but then I think you have to sort of think about it, and this is where the dissents will come into play, in terms of how this will actually play out in terms of day-to-day -day law enforcement, both in terms of what it then allows police to do, what it may be suggesting that they, that they ought not to do. Great. Uh, so there were two dissents in the case. Dr. Glenn mentioned all three female justices were in the dissent. Um, the one dissent was written by Kagan that Ginsburg joins. If you go to law school, you, know, you might enjoy it. It's a purely legal sort of analysis. <laughs> um, the better one, though, the better one because it's written for a more popular audience is the dissent that was written by Justice Sotomayor. Uh, Ginsburg joined most parts of it. I'll, I'll talk about the part that she did not join. Um, but the the 
the essential kind of argument that Sotomayor makes is this, um, and let me just ask you, how many of you, your parents ever told you two wrongs do not make a right? Okay, that's her dissent, right? Her dissent is very practical, uh, and her dissent is simply, look, everyone agrees this was an illegal stop. This was an illegal seizure by the police officer. That's the first wrong. The second wrong is when he asked uh, Mr. Street for his ID and then ran the, the check on the ID. Um, those are the two wrongs, and those two wrongs do not make a right. So, you know, she says that this is just simply a violation uh, of past court precedent uh, about permissible police activity. Then she gets a little more on the ground, and by the way, it's very rare that a Supreme Court dissent makes the front page of the New York Times. This did. Yeah. Uh, and so she says this. She says, you have to think of it in terms of the, the number of outstanding misdemeanor warrants in the system. So if a police officer is allowed to stop a person and ask for their ID, run the ID, here's what they'll come up with. Utah, just one state, this is the state that the case uh, comes from. Utah has over 180,000 misdemeanor warrants in its database. Salt Lake City or Salt Lake County had a backlog of outstanding warrants so large that it faced the potential for civil liability. Um, she also cites the Ferguson report, the report uh, looking at issues in the St. Louis metropolitan area. Um, so that's her, that's her argument. Then she, the last point, she has a part of her dissent that no one joins, so she's by herself. And so she makes the point that police stops are very, or can be very degrading. So she says, the officer's control over you does not end with the stop like you might think. If the officer chooses, he may handcuff you, take you to jail for doing nothing more than speeding, jaywalking, or driving your pickup truck with your three-year-old son and five-year-old daughter without your seatbelt fastened. That's from a previous case. At jail, he can fingerprint you, swab DNA from the inside of your mouth, and force you to shower with a delousing agent while you lift your tongue, hold out your arms, turn around and lift up your genitals. So she says, this is not just normal behavior that you know, we think it might be, that this is a very, uh, or it can be a very degrading uh, experience for a lot of Americans who have even an outstanding misdemeanor warrant like failing to pay a traffic ticket. And I'm not gonna ask you know, how many of you might have, <laughs> right? but it might be more than you think. So uh, it was a very practical, hard hitting, sort of on the ground uh, dissent by Justice Sotomayor. Her fear and, and the fear of her, her colleagues, what now prevents a law enforcement officer from detaining any of you, asking for your identification and running a check. If it turns out the check produces nothing, you've been harassed, you've lost 15 or 20 minutes, you're on your way. But given the enormous number of people who have such a record, and again, as Professor Kreider said, you may not even know you haven't paid a ticket. You might not even know you got a ticket one time. Will police then use that to their advantage and stop anyone based on appearance or behavior on the street and then say, well, you know, I, I didn't conduct the search until I discovered the warrant. Once I discover the warrant, I can conduct the search. Her fear is a very practical fear. And, and um, it's no accident that Justice Sotomayor cites statistics from inner cities and talks about the effect that this might have on minorities as well, who uh, the numbers show are far more likely to be stopped for whatever reason uh, than are non-minorities. We have a couple minutes remaining. It's tough to go through abortion in a handful of minutes, but we'll do our best. The state of Texas, several years ago, uh, in a stated effort to ensure maternal health at abortion clinics, passed a law that had two components. It required that any doctor performing or inducing an abortion have admitting privileges at a hospital no more than 30 miles away. A second requirement at any facility that performed or induced an abortion, the facility would have to meet very stringent 
health standards, the high health standards even required uh, in the state of Texas. Texas did not prohibit abortion. That would be in violation of Roe versus Wade, Planned Parenthood of Casey uh, versus Southeastern Pennsylvania. But certainly these laws made it more difficult for women in Texas to get an abortion. And I won't go deep into the numbers, but suffice it to say that had these laws been able to go into effect, the availability of abortion clinics would have dropped significantly throughout the state of Texas, thus requiring women wanting to obtain an abortion to travel hundreds and hundreds of miles to metropolitan areas where clinics met these requirements and where physicians had admitting privileges at local hospitals. The divide here was five to three. Professor Stevenson? Yeah, so if it's five to three, and I think we could confidently assume um, that had Justice Scalia been, been on the court, uh, it would have been uh, certainly five, five to four. So his presence would not have uh, affected the outcome of the case. This was, a, I think, a hugely important decision. Uh, really, it's about the first time in some, I guess, 24 years uh, that the court has handed down an abortion ruling that was as significant as this. The, the probably the next closest significant would be the partial birth abortion case in, in, in 2007. But uh, uh, for a reason I'll mention uh, shortly, I think this is probably even more significant than that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, the standard that has kind of been part and parcel of the Supreme Court's ruling on abortion, at least since 1992, is that um, um, state regulations of abortion um, falling short of prohibitions of abortion are not to impose an undue burden. And so the sort of traditional way of, of tackling that would be to say, okay, if you put these regulations in place, then how much harder are you making it for someone who wants to get an abortion to actually get an abortion? Um, now, I think the court could have taken that traditional approach here and re uh, reach the same result. But what's, I think, significant about what the majority opinion does here uh, is that, uh, in terms of what Justice Breyer uh, says, that uh, he's not focusing so much on the obstacle for the woman, he's actually looking and analyzing the justification for the regulation itself. That is to say, what good is served by, for instance, the requirement that an abortion doing facility has to meet the standards for ambulatory surgery centers, uh, having to do with uh, lighting, with widths of hallways, and, and all the rest. So he, he really does zero in on the particular regulation, the substance of the regulation, to say and to ask the question, does this actually promote somebody's health? Are you actually making abortion safer when you do this? And the way he does that in the, his analysis is he concludes it's a long um, approach that Texas had used, but it was the methodology that the court used in examining the regulations, not so much looking at whether you were putting the certain obstacles in the way of women who wanted an abortion, but actually going to the nitty gritty of do you really need that? Are, are women's actually safer because of these regulations? Or are you simply using the idea of safety as a way to either discourage women by putting the clinics too far away, or making them more expensive, or reducing the number of uh, abortion you know, facility centers? He goes so far as to say uh, that, that these laws uh, solve a problem that doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> that, that Texas had manufactured the problem to justify the restrictions. And um, that is rare for uh, a, a court to say that, uh, especially when it could have been decided 
uh, much more neatly yeah. under the two-prong yeah. test from 1992. One of the interesting things, uh, for those of you who haven't had courses in constitutional law, I don't know if you picked up on the language Professor Stevenson used. You know, the current standard is that the law may not pose an undue burden. A burden is okay, but the burden can't be undue. The, law, the, the laws may not present a substantial obstacle. Obstacles are okay as long as they're not substantial. Yeah. And these are word games that, that courts play all the time to, to persuade you that there's some ironclad rule easily applied. You walk out of uh, a conference like this, you say, wow, now I know the rule. <laughs> but uh, hardly, in this case, demonstrates well. Um, there are plenty of laws that pose burdens and obstacles on women where the court has said, ah, but that obstacle isn't substantial and that burden isn't undue. And the court never gives you definitions of that. You just have to work it out in practice. Yeah. I, re I recall some years ago a, a student in class asked me, you know, what's an undue burden? And I said, well, the, the, the idea of the undue burden originated when Justice O'Connor, Sandra Day O'Connor, was on the Supreme Court. And Justice O'Connor would, you know, say, okay, the laws aren't supposed to impose an undue burden. What's an undue burden? Well, it's a burden that Justice O'Connor considers undue because <laughs> she provided the swing vote. If she thought it was undue, <laughs> down it went. If she didn't, up it was fine. Kyle, I cut you off. No, I'm no, sorry. Uh, I know we're out of time, so the only thing I'll say is if you rem remember my talk from 50 minutes ago, this, this kind of fits nicely because yeah. um, yes. there's a dissent that Alito, Chief Justice Roberts, and, and Thomas are, are in that is, is just simply um, uh, very technical, um, and it's about essentially civil procedure. Uh, there's only one justice, and that's Justice Thomas, who actually talks to us about the merits uh, of the Texas law, and Thomas just simply interprets the, the standard very differently uh, and says that um, this Texas law does not pose an undue burden uh, on women and that we should defer to what the Texas legislature uh, had to say about this law. So. Ms. Glazier. I just want to say I hope someday somebody will explain what's happened to Justice Kennedy. But that seems to me to be, I mean, the, the takeaway here is that he's originally described as being in the more conservative wing. And there's been obviously some sort of awakening or shift in his thinking. And, uh, you know who would, you know who would, Justice Scalia's take on that question would be fascinating. He, um, there are a number of uh, people who have weighed in uh, on what has happened to Kennedy. Uh, Justice Scalia is certainly disappointed by what he has seen <laughs> from, from, from Justice Kennedy. And uh, there was one opinion, it might have been the Atkins or it may have been Roper, I can't recall, but uh, Justice Scalia certainly hints that uh, Kennedy has fallen, help me here, fallen victim to, he's fallen in love with Europe. And, and, and Europe's approach to things, and, and, and therefore he has become more liberal uh, and, and less conservative. Uh, Here, here's one theory. Justice Scalia pushed him to the more liberal camp. That's certainly true with O'Connor. He travels in Europe every summer, I'm telling you. <laughs> He travels in Europe every summer, and and uh, and that's poisonous thoughts there, you know. And he's from California. Yeah. And appointed by Reagan. Yes. Questions. That was a good question, though, about Kennedy. I like that. <laughs> if you discover the answer, you let us yeah, know. Let us know. Well, I think a lot depends not just on the outcome of the election, but I think well, in terms of the presidential, but what happens in the, in the Senate, 
in terms of who's going to be in charge of the Senate after after January. Um, so if 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 the Republicans lose that, that's one set of possibilities. Um, if they keep it, it's something else. So obviously, if 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 Democrats are going to be in charge of the Senate after, say, a President Clinton takes office, then I think you will, that I, I, I would suspect there would be very, very quick action um, in a lame duck session. Um, that's just, uh, I, I mean, I think there are a couple of different variables there. I mean, even though we say, okay, Clinton's, you know, probably going to win the election. Uh, that doesn't tell us what's going to happen in the Senate. And those are two very, very different outcomes. It would seem, my, my take on that, Orlando, it would seem um, I'm, I'm not certain Clinton would request that Garland's name be withdrawn. And, and, and um, even though uh, it's doubtful that he would have been her pick should she be president, it does seem a bit selfish to Take a man who suffered through nine months of of, yeah. of nothing, yeah. and you know, I mean, the the odds of the Democrats taking back the Senate are probably 50-50, which changes the dynamic. But um, uh, I, I don't know that uh, um, you know, on the, on the first day of Obama's presidency, uh, uh, the, the conflict between the president and the Senate was laid bare. Uh, I wouldn't expect it to be a whole lot better if if Clinton becomes president, maybe worse. Um, but uh, Merrick Garland would certainly be more appealing the second week of November should Hillary Clinton be the president-elect the second week of November. Yeah, they might confirm Garland in record speed yeah, if, if that election turns out the way most people think it will. Yes, sir. If what you just described is the case, then Clinton wins and um, the affirmative action comes up again. Yeah. You know, or all the cases relate to that you all outlined, right? I mean, yeah. how do you see the future with a more liberal court? Seems to me like affirmative action is is on as solid a footing yeah. as it's been in a while. Yeah. And if Clinton were to win the presidency, I, I, I can't fathom that the Republicans could prevent a vote for four years, although they might try. Um, uh, so, I, you know, for the proponents of affirmative action, a lot rests on, on what happens the first week of November, I think. Yeah, I mean, we don't know, at least I don't know, maybe you do, but where Garland stands on affirmative action. Um, but, you know, it's probably here to stay. Yeah, it's because I guess the D.C. Circuit just would not. Yeah, it, 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 I, I just there are any of those kind of cases that, that, that would that go through there. And and the Fisher vote it is four to three, but it may be more accurately be five to three because Kagan would jump back in on the next affirmative yeah, action that, case. That's right. So um, you know, e even if uh, Donald Trump were to be elected uh, in November and take office in January, mm -hmm. I mean it would be a little more tenuous, but. It seems to me like affirmative action is in a place yeah. it hasn't been in a long time yes, right now. My, my only hesitation is that to say it's on the firmest ground it's been in a long time, I, I guess that's true, but that's basing it on Kennedy's one vote. So yeah. the yeah. only yeah. time he's ever voted in favor of affirmative action uh, yeah. you know, was this past case. So I mean, who, who knows with him? I mean, yeah. if the facts are different, a different circumstance, maybe, maybe he would say that it would not pass compelling, uh, would not you know, be a compelling state interest. It's a wonderful reminder of how uh, how uh, a single vote uh, can alter the course of important public policy issues. Well, thank you for your attendance today. Enjoy the rest of the conference.